Do you really want to live or not? It's a question I ask people frequently. Most psychotherapists uh, don't run into that problem. I can remember at the first meeting I was with with Larry LaShawn, who wrote You Can Fight for Your Life, he was surprised that a quarter of the people I see don't even want to live. Cancer's terrific, lets them out of life. But you have to remember that if you write a book called You Can Fight for Your Life, who shows up in your office? People who want to live. There are many people who show up in my office who don't have an option. Um, they are in trouble, they may be in pain, they need a doctor to help them. And I can say to them, do you really want to live or not? I can remember one lady who came in asking me to operate on her. She had quit all her cardiac drugs, kidney drugs, and was sitting there smoking in an office with a big sign that says, don't smoke. And I walked in and I said to her, I think you want me to kill you. And she said, nobody talks to me like that except my psychotherapist. I became her friend, her lover, in a sense, her family member, to give her a reason for living. And then she could find a reason to go on after she took care of herself medically and could survive a procedure. I was walking through the hospital one night and I heard a noise coming out of a room. I walked in, I knew one of my partners was in there, the woman with breast cancer who's age 55. And the family's sitting around and they're going through, step by step, all of the best treatments for breast cancer, over and over again, all of which the lady is questioning, denying, refusing. And finally, because I know that routine, I said, I don't think you want to live. And the family jumps up and says, oh, who, who are you to interrupt, rude? And the woman said, wait a minute, he's right. My mother's 90 and see now in a nursing home and I never want to get to be like my mother. I spent a couple of days with that lady teaching her what living was about. And I must say, friends, and all those watching, the bonus of taking charge of your life is you can die when you want to. We may get into that more later, but if you take charge of living, when you turn off the live mechanisms, you'll die when you want to. It includes saying things like, I'm dying Thursday at two o'clock when the kids get here from California or waiting for my husband to hold my hand, or whatever. But you have to look at first, do you want to live, and do you want to make that effort? I know, even the people who join our groups, when I say to them, do you want to meditate three or four times a day, or even up to six times a day, maybe for 10 minutes, so you're taking an hour out to save your life, to reaffirm to yourself that you want to live. They say, oh, dinner will be late, how can I manage that? Oh, my husband will yell at me. Or the kids have, you know, it's ridiculous. You're not giving yourself live messages. And I think that's what you have to do. And it may mean interrupting your day six times for 10 minutes, saying, I want to live. Uh, I make a lot of tapes for patients, but I think what's even more meaningful now that I've come across many people who have made their own tapes. They never knew Bernie Siegel. They did their own thing, and somewhere along the way, we meet in the hospital or somewhere, and we start talking. They have sat down, made their own tapes. They're listening to their voice say, I want you to live. What's more meaningful than listening to yourself give yourself that live and love message? And those are the things that become important. Look at your life. I know that when I say to people, what happened in the year or two before you became sick, 90% of them pour out a significant story, a significant change in their life. For many, it's a loss, but significant change is what we're talking about. And so look at what's going on the last year or two. That's not to set you up to be a failure or say you're a terrible person, look what you've done to yourself. It's to teach you, see. I think we should use the illness as something to help us grow as individuals. And that means sore throat, laryngitis, broken ankle, or cancer. Look at why it happened, you see. We talk to our bodies all the time. You know, what are those little sayings? Pain in the neck, get off my back, you're breaking my heart, it's eating me up at live, that kid's a pain in the ass, and on and on and on, and then wonder what part of your body gets sick. If I want to stop being a surgeon, laryngitis really doesn't help me. I can still operate with my hands. If I didn't want to be on this tape, then I'd have to get laryngitis to get out of it. And so look at the part of your body. Why do you need the illness is a better way of putting it, see? What do you gain from your illness? Uh, we're brought up on sick days, not health days. When you got a job, what did they tell you? You don't want to come to work, call up and say, you're sick, we'll all love you and nurture you and you'll stay home a day. What I'm saying to you is take a health day in all ways. Take care of yourself. Call up and say, I'm not coming in today because I want to stay healthy. But in a sense, think that when you get up in the morning. It's okay to put the word cancer on your refrigerator because what cancer is saying is, I must live a certain way today. And if I live that way, then I have much more likelihood of having another day. But look at it. Use it. Again, the question is, do you want to live? And that's coming from a deep level, you see. 
because within us, whether you call it our DNA or that inner voice or your belly button or your heart, there is a voice saying, I want you to be the best and most beautiful creature you can be. If you obstruct that inner voice, what happens? Emotional breakdown. So you go to a psychiatrist or a therapist, and if they give you a pill or a tranquilizer, you go home the same way. If you get your ulcer, your cancer, your high blood pressure, you go to a doctor. If he's a mechanic, he says, here's a pill, here's an operation, go home. If you talk to any good primitive shaman, they tell you, we don't just treat disease, we treat people. We try to change people. And that's the problem. If you go to a mechanic with your illness, they never say to you, do you want to live or not, and change who you are. They treat the illness. You have to find the right position or within yourself understand that message and know that it is that change, that attention to yourself, that inner voice that's saying, yes, I want you to live. You have to really drop the old messages that you've gotten up until this point. You may not, if, if you've been told you'll be dead in a month, you don't have time for three years of psychoanalysis, as one lady said to me, bringing up all my self-destructive tendencies. You're not gonna feel good spending three years on your self-destructive tendencies. You have to look at your joy, your life. Larry LaShawn tells a little story about a man who said, I want to be a doctor when I grow up. Well, the man was already in his 60s, so it didn't seem quite appropriate. But uh, what Larry said to him was, well, what did being a doctor mean? He said, well, I'd like to have a little office. People come in and make them feel good, and then they go out again, and that's what being a doctor is. And they found him a job alongside the parkway in the stand for tourists. And so people come in who are on vacation, look for a place to stay, activities. He has his little building, his little office. He tells them what to do, how to have a good time, and they leave feeling better. That fulfilled for him what being a doctor meant, and it helped heal him. And you can go on and on telling anecdotes. I tell anecdotes because you can't fight about anecdotes. They're true. They may not create a lot of statistics, but I don't want to argue about statistics. I'm telling you what happens if you allow the will to live that is inside of you to step forth. You will exceed any doctor's expectations, and many of you will get well when you're not supposed to. I know it can happen. I've seen it happen. It's part of why I sit in the office for hours <laughs> my wife searches for me. We have an extra phone uh, buzzer in the office so that my phone buzzes separately so that people are searching for me at odd hours. I will hear the phone. But I'm sitting there because I know that maybe the next person I talk to won't die. And when we travel around the country, everywhere I go, people walk up to me and say, you know, you told me I didn't have to die, and I didn't. That's what keeps me going, what reinforces me. But what is more beautiful is also what those people accomplish who do die. As I said, death is not a failure. I'm not telling you to do this so you'll live forever. I'm telling you to do it so that your life will be meaningful and that you will make meaningful the lives of many others by touching them. And then you heal a lot of people and you become a healer. And you have that potential within you. Energy is intelligent. Your immune system is intelligent. What I'm saying to you gets back to being scientific. Um, you know, a lot of this was scoffed at by the medical profession. Part of it is because they don't read the right journals. But now we know that there are connections between the central nervous system and your thymus and your spleen. So all of this is scientific. The feeling, the will to live is converted into a physical activity in your body, and your body fights for your life.